First John chapter three. First John's right near the end of the Bible. First, second, third John, New Revelation. If you're flipping through, you're gonna have a hard time finding it because it's just it's a little book, but uh, very, very powerful. First John chapter three. This morning, um, I'm gonna be preaching from verses 19 through 20, but. Let's read verses 11 through 24 for context. This is God's holy word. It's inspired by His Holy Spirit, and so it's inerrant, it's infallible. It is our rule for faith and life. So let's give it our attention as it's read. 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in them. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Thus far, God's Word. Please be seated. Doubt, uncertainty, hesitation, fear, suspicion, skepticism, stumbling, misgiving, reluctance, wavering, faltering. Have you ever questioned your faith? Have you ever asked yourself, am I, am I really a Christian? And, have I really been saved? Has he done this for me? That's what I was asking the communicants class this morning. Have you ever wrestled with the assurance of your salvation? Have you experienced doubt? After all, how do you know that you're saved? How do you really know that you are one of God's chosen elect. How do you really know that you know that you know that you're not simply just a bank believer going through the motions? Doubt is a very real problem for the Christian. A dark temptation that plagues many believers at different times and with different degrees of severity at different points in life. Some struggle with it more than others. And in our passage this morning, John addresses the issue of doubt. Kids, do you, do you know what doubt is? Yes. When you question if something is true, if you question your trust of it, sometimes you have a good reason to doubt if something is true. Have you ever had a friend who likes to tell lies, 
friend or a neighbor or someone at school that you never, you never really know if what they're saying is true because they're always telling lies. And so you begin to doubt when they say something. You begin to doubt if it's true or not. Should you believe what God says to you, kids? What do you think? Should you believe that? Yes. And where does God speak to you? Everywhere. Where specifically do we go to hear His voice? Prayer. Well, prayer is when we talk to Him. Where does He talk to us? In the Bible. That's right, Grace. You can say it louder. You can say it louder. In the Bible. God speaks to us in the Bible. It is His Word. And He never lies. He always keeps His promises. And so we ought always to trust Him. God never gives us a reason to doubt Him. Although we may struggle with doubt, God never gives us a reason to doubt Him. John's main purpose for writing this letter to a church that has been ripped apart by false teachers uh, is clearly expressed in, in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. This is his purpose statement for this letter. And here, in chapter 3, John reassures you of your true faith in Christ by addressing the difficult and often painful problem of doubt. He refocuses us on the main theme of this letter, true assurance of the Christian faith. And he says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. James Montgomery Boyce comments on this verse. He says, This self-condemnation can be due to a number of factors. It can be a matter of disposition. Some people are just more introspective and melancholy than others. It may be a question of health. How a person feels inevitably affects how he thinks. It may be due to specific sin. It may be due to circumstances. But whatever the cause, the problem is a real one and is quite widespread. Christian philosopher William Lane Craig writes, Any Christian who is intellectually engaged, reflecting about his faith, will inevitably face the problem of doubt. At times you may identify with the father who brought his child to Jesus to be healed in Mark 9, 24, who cried out to him, I believe, help my unbelief. However, John says this morning, by this you shall know you are of the truth. You can know with great certainty that you are a Christian, that you are God's beloved child, that He has saved you by His grace. At times, your heart does condemn you. It becomes filled with doubt. And as we've already seen, this can happen for a variety of different reasons in different seasons of your life. If you're struggling with a besetting sin, if you have fallen into great sin, the very fact that you're living contrary to your profession of faith should cause you to question the genuineness of your faith. When we turn away from Christ in our lives, when we stop repenting of our sin, and we start living in it, that invites doubt. Think of Peter's circumstances when Jesus called him to walk on the water in Matthew 14. When he saw the wind, he saw the waves, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
Maybe you're struggling with something difficult and painful. You have great suffering in your life. And you've allowed yourself to question God's goodness, His grace, His mercy, and His love because of your suffering or because of the suffering of a loved one. You've taken your eyes off of Christ and not trusted Him to provide all things for you, even in the midst of your suffering. Or maybe you've experienced a challenge to your faith by a non-Christian who wants to win you over to their own worldview. Or maybe you have a college professor who gets his jollies by trying to crack the faith of young Christians. There's no shortage of them around either. I had them when I was in college. If you're struggling with doubt, as I'm sure some of you are, it is because you are human. But there is hope even in the midst of that struggle. Bye. John says, for whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. Though you may be ready to condemn yourself, to set yourself up as the judge over your soul and sentence yourself to hell, though your heart is overcome with doubt and your faith is faltering, God comes to you and says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Whether or not you're condemned or justified does not lay in your hands. John says God is greater than your heart. And he knows everything. He knows who his children are. He knows. He knows the name of every one of his beloved children whom he has justified, whom he has declared to be righteous based on the finished work of his son, Jesus. Do we know who the elect are? Do we have a list? No. Is there a website you can go to? Is there an Instagram account that says these are the elect? We don't know who the elect are. God has not seen fit to tell us that. He has said, you get out there and you preach the gospel to everybody and I'm going to save my people. Charles Spurgeon, one, one time somebody used to ask him, why do you go around preaching to everybody? He said, well, you know, you know if God elects, if God elects his people, why do you go around preaching yeah. to everybody? He said, well, if God, had, if God had put a yellow stripe up the back of every one of his elect, then I wouldn't do what I do. I'd run around lifting up people's shirt tails, and then I'd find the yellow stripes, and I would preach the gospel to those people. But God hasn't done that. I don't know the elect. So we preach the gospel to all men. Because He knows whom He is saved. He knows whom He has set His love upon, whom He has sent His Son to live for and to die for. Those whom really were saved when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Though your heart may seek to condemn you, your doubt cannot undo your justification. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus your Lord. If your heart condemns you for a guilty conscience, then simply confess your sin. Repent of it, turn from it, and serve Christ with all of your heart. Remember that no matter how far you fall, no matter how bad you mess up in your life, and it can get really bad, it can get really nasty and ugly. I've been reading through Kings in my daily Bible reading, and it's just abysmal. No matter how far you fall, in Christ, He will never leave you or forsake you. Because simply put, you are not saved by your works. You are saved by the finished work of Christ. 
One popular misunderstanding of Christianity is that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's how a lot of people would summarize the Christian worldview. When it all comes down to it. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell, and I'm a pretty good person, so God's going to let me in. It's not an informed worldview. I didn't say it was biblically informed, but I'm just saying that a lot of people believe it. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. The problem with that ultimately is there are no good people. None. There are only bad people. And so some of these bad people go to heaven, and some of these bad people go to hell. And why is that? How can a sinful person go to heaven? How can a sinful person be let in to God's heaven only through being saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ? The only way to the Father is through the Son. He has to take the punishment for your sin, and He has to give His righteousness to your account so that you can stand before the Father as the just judge of all and be declared to be righteous. There is absolutely nothing that you can add to this. You're not able to merit, to earn any part of your salvation. It is from beginning to end, it is from first to last, a work of God's sovereign grace. It's not that Jesus gets you in the door and then it's up to you. The Spirit meant what he said through the Apostle Paul, and I'll repeat it again, there is no condemnation for you in Christ. Though doubts may rise up in your heart, don't allow them to remain, don't wallow in it. You must struggle against doubt by fleeing to Christ. Listen to the strong caution that James gives against doubt in James 1. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When we pray, we pray knowing we're praying to the God, the one true and living God, who can do all things. We don't pray with doubt, like, like so many people say, when you say, you say, can I pray for you? And the answer is, couldn't hurt. What an understatement, couldn't hurt. That is praying with doubt. And so as you go into this week, seeking to serve the Lord, pray to the Father with confidence, even as, even as we had that wonderful word of encouragement from Danny Oliver last week, from Luke, encouraging us and using this means of grace that God has given to us. Prayer. Praying with faith to the Father, with confidence, knowing that He is who He says He is. He will do what He's promised to do for you in Jesus through the power of His Spirit. Remember that in Christ you are not condemned, but you are justified by grace through faith alone based on His perfect merit. And as a child of God, that you have full confidence to come to Him in prayer. That He has the power to do all things according to His perfect will. That He loves to bless his children and that he has never given you a reason to doubt him because he is always faithful. We're not. We're not faithful, but he is. In your new life in the Spirit, you know true communion with Christ and with his body. Love one another care for one another, do what is right and what is good for one another. This pleases, this glorifies God. Reach out to those who struggle 
to build them up in the faith, to be an encouragement to them. Listen to Jude 1. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. The truth is powerful. You have the truth. You have been steward of it. You can use it to be an instrument of the Spirit's work to change someone's life. As Christians, we're not called to build monuments in our own name, to leave behind these legacies that the world is so focused on. A library somewhere with my name on it or whatever. Um, I just I just tell people that all that stuff down in Galveston is me. Uh, <laughs> Moody Gardens, the Moody Mansion. No. What difference does it make after we're gone? Nothing. But what what better legacy to leave to leave behind when God calls you home than to see that you have served Him faithfully and you've seen lives changed by His work for His glory. And then those lives changing others' lives. And it goes on and on and on. Through the power of the gospel. Build yourselves up in the faith. Have mercy on those who doubt. Reach out to those who struggle. And when you struggle, reach out for help. May your trust in what God has revealed to you in His Word expel doubt from your heart so that you can serve Him and love Him in full confidence with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And that you will love your neighbor as yourself.